You know, there is a word that we don't seem to hear as much anymore in our vocabulary unless it tends to pertain to military personnel. It is the word honor. What does that word mean? Honor. If you look it up, it, from a biblical standpoint, means esteem. It means value. It has to do with great respect. So when we honor someone, what we are doing is we are regarding or treating that person with respect and admiration. We are showing admiration for them in a public way. Folks, I believe that many of the problems that we are seeing in our society today have to do with a lack of honor being shown to others. A lack of respect, a lack of, of admiration, a lack of appreciation, if you will. Um, choosing to show honor is something that we make a conscious choice of doing. And we as God's people, this is, I guess, my challenge for you today. We as God's people, perhaps more than ever before, need to work to rebuild what somebody has labeled a culture of honor, where we honor one another. We need to rebuild that. There was a time when you saw more of that. As a matter of fact, there is one translation of the passage that we're looking at that's up here before you, Romans chapter 12, verse 10, the latter part of that verse, that literally says, take the lead in showing honor to one another. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning, to take the lead in showing honor to others. Somebody has said that it's respect that people have to earn. You earn respect. But honor is a gift that you freely give to those around you. Let me say that again. Respect is what we earn, but honor is a gift that is freely given. I'm going to encourage each of you to, if you haven't already been doing it, to begin giving that gift away more often. The gift of honor to those people that you encounter. But we need to put some flesh on this thing called showing honor. What does it look like? I want to take you to two passages of Scripture because in each of these passages what we find are examples of honor being given. And in both situations, it's the greater giving honor to the lesser. The first place is in Genesis chapter 13. In Genesis chapter 13, just kind of set up the background for you here, Abraham has left Ur of the Chaldees, followed his father um, to Tehran, or to Haran, and then will eventually come into the land of Canaan because that's where God will lead him. His father dies, and he and Lot and his wife, that is Abraham's, or he's still called Abram at this point, Abram's wife, Sarai, will make their way into Canaan, Lot following. Well now, Abr Abram, I keep on saying Abraham, but here it's still Abram. Abram and Lot are both very wealthy. They both have a number of servants. They both have large flocks, large herds, many tents. And so when they spread out, they kind of take over a place. Well, there's something that begins to happen because of all of the flocks and the herds that they have between them. As a matter of fact, that's what's brought out in our passage here. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 6, what Moses would record for us is that their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. The reason that they were not able to remain together is because strife was beginning to develop between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot. So here's what Abram does. Now remember, Abram is Lot's uncle. Abram is older. He was 75 when he left Ur of the Chaldees. We're not sure how old Lot is, but he's younger than Abram. 
Abram takes him aside, and here's what he says in Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. He says, please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, I will go to the right. If to the right, I will go to the left. Abram is saying to Lot, it's not working for us to remain together. It's creating strife amongst our herdsmen. The best thing for us to do is separate. You go one direction, I'll go to the other. I'll give you the first choice. Well, here's what Lot does. If you'll notice the very next, the next two verses, beginning in verse 10, it says there, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Moses adds a little thing. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he describes it further. He says, it was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram gave Lot the first choice. Abram honored Lot. Because Abram gave Lot something that Lot was not actually worthy of, I guess you might say. And what I mean by that is that Lot was not Abram's equal. And yet, even though that was the case, Abram still said to Lot, you choose first. Whatever you choose, you take that, I'll go the other direction. What should have happened in that case? What should have happened probably is that Lot should have said to Abram, his uncle, after Abram made the offers, no, no, Uncle Abram, I'm sorry, I can't do that. You have guided me, you've overseen me after my father's death, you've been good to me, I don't deserve all of this. You take the best, you take that land, you take the well-watered valley, and I'll go over here to the other side because you deserve it so much more than I do. But that's not what happened. Abram honored Lot. It should have been the other way around. It should have been Lot honoring Abram in this situation. But notice that Abram humbled himself and honored Lot. The other situation that we find, or the other example of this, is what was just read for us a minute ago by Caden. It's over in John chapter 13. You may remember the disciples are at the Last Supper. During the supper, Jesus, as John records it for us, gets up, takes off his outer garment, girds himself with a towel, prepares a basin of water, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. After he has finished washing the disciples' feet, he gets up from that, or girds himself again, puts his, puts his outer garment back on, and then asks them if they recognize or realize what he's done. The lesser was blessed by the greater. The lesser was honored by the greater. Here was the one who had spoken all of creation into existence. Here was the one who was God in the flesh. And yet what does he do? He honors these men who have followed him by doing what? By washing their feet. Now I don't believe this is a lesson on the need for feet washing. I believe it is a lesson on honor, on service, on doing for others. And that's typically what honor tends to be. So whom are we to honor? There are several that the Bible brings out. We don't have time to look at all of them, but I want to just touch on a few. First and foremost, you and I are to honor God with our lives. If you look at Revelation, there are several places, but I want to draw your minds to one place in Revelation. It's in chapter 5, verse 13, where John writes this, that every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying. Well, what is what is this great host saying? Here's what he tells them, or what they say. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. What this great host is declaring is that God the Father and Christ the Son or the Lamb are worthy of this great honor. But all true honor issues from a heart which has surrendered to the King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Our culture has reached a point in which we tend to treat God as common. We're all too familiar with Him. Maybe you have heard somebody say in referring to God, the man upstairs, or maybe they've used something like the big guy. Folks, that's lowering God to our level. We're speaking about the one who in Psalm 46, verse 10, said of himself, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We're speaking about the one whose son presently rules and reigns according to what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, is king of kings and lord of lords. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. There is no one that exists above him. And he is worthy of all honor and all praise. God. But another that we are to honor that is often referenced in our scriptures, maybe I should say others, are our parents. Do you realize that when it, the word honor is used in a command, that the command to honor our parents is found more in scripture than any other verse referring to honor? Go back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and there you will find it. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Honor your father and your mother. No verse is quoted as much as this one verse when it comes to honoring our parents. But not only as children are we not to speak disrespectfully of them or not to behave disrespectfully toward them, we're also not to, to, to talk about them to others behind their backs in a disrespectful way. And the interesting thing is that Scripture sets no bounds upon the point in our lives at which we as children are no longer to be disrespectful or no longer, maybe I should say, to honor our parents. It doesn't matter how old we are, we are still to honor our parents. I love a passage, it's in... Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, Moses instructed the children of Israel, you shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged. Ladies, there's no need to color your hair because God says we honor the gray-headed. You shall revere your God. I am the Lord. We should continue to honor our parents even into the twilight of their lives. A good way to demonstrate that is for you to speak well of your parents before your grandchildren. Why is that so important? Because remember one day you're going to be where your parents are today and how will your children treat you if you have been disrespectful and have dishonored your parents. If you want your children to honor you, Honor your parents. Yes, we are to show honor toward our parents. And then not only that, we're to show honor to people who are in authority. The way that we find it put in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, is that we are to honor all people, love the brotherhood, and then he says honor the king. And when he refers to the king, we don't live in a kingdom here upon this earth, not in the sense that this is speaking about. We do have a democracy, republic, we have a president, we have congressmen, we have all of those, and, and we are to honor the people who are in government, those who have been set in authority over us. But I don't think that this is just limited to those who are in government positions over us. Let me share some other things with you of people that we are to honor. Young people, are you a student in school? If so, I want to encourage you to honor your teachers and your principal and others who are in authority over you in your school system. Do you play sports? Honor your coaches. Show them honor that is worthy of their position. Are you an employee, adults or even young people? Then honor your employers, honor your supervisors. Paul tells us that we are to honor those who lead us spiritually. He puts it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. He says that the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work at preaching and teaching. 
Now, in the first century church, all, all of the elders gave attention to the welfare of those who were placed in their charge, the interest of those who were under them, the, the flock, if you will. However, what we find, according to Timothy, is that there were some elders who went a step beyond that. There were some elders who were devoting themselves to the study of the Word so that they might both preach and teach that Word to those in the congregations that they were responsible for. And Paul said, these men are worthy of double honor. If they're teaching you, if they're preaching in your pulpits, he says you honor them. And finally, all people. We're to honor everyone. Paul put it this way in Romans 13, verse 7. He says, render to all what is due them. And then he goes through tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear. And he ends that with honor to whom honor. And then that passage I just shared with you from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. If you begin the very beginning of that verse, it says, honor all people. Paul said that we're to honor the widows who are widows indeed. What does he mean by that? It's those widows who no longer have a husband, do not have children or grandchildren, or are brothers or sisters that they can depend upon to help take care of their needs. We as a church are to step up in that case, and we are to honor them by doing things for them when they need it. Maybe taking them to a doctor's appointment, maybe taking them to get their groceries, maybe fixing something in their house, maybe opening a door for them, but we are to honor them. And Peter said that we men are to honor our wives as fellow heirs of the grace of life. We have a responsibility to our wives, and if we don't do that, then one of the things that Peter brings out is that our prayers will be hindered because of the way we treat our wives or in the way we fail to treat our wives. So ultimately, honor is due to all people, but I think that's true for three basic reasons, something that applies to all of us in this room this morning and to everyone that we will encounter every day of our lives, and it is the fact that every single individual upon the face of this planet is created in the image of God. They are due honor, if for no other reason, than that they are created in the image of our Maker. And that's one lesson that needs to be communicated to this world. Life is valuable because life Every individual life is created in the image of God. But secondly, it's also because Jesus died for them, just as he died for each one of us. We are due honor because we do, we are responsible to show honor to others because Jesus died for them. And thirdly, it is because God has plans for their lives, just as he has a plan for your life. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has plans. And you and I may be one of the ways in which he seeks to facilitate that plan as we demonstrate honor toward those around us. So what does it mean? Notice the outline that you have before you. What I put up here on this first slide is a translation from the English Standard Version which says, outdo others in showing honor. What does it mean to outdo somebody in showing honor? What it means is that we take the lead, each of us individually work to take the lead, we try to outdo somebody else in showing honor. Men, did you ever try to outdo somebody in work? I can remember many years ago when I was a teenager hauling hay, and we'd get in a competition as to who could load the most bales of hay on a particular trailer or wagon, or who could throw the most bales up in the barn, whatever it was, there was always some kind of competition going on. It was one person trying to outdo another. In sports, we do that, don't we? Who can hit the most two-pointers? Who can hit the most layups? Who can, whatever. We try to outdo. We men understand that when it comes to competition because we thrive on it. But when it comes to outdoing one another and showing honor, folks, that begins with an eagerness to show honor to somebody else. And we are competing for the last position. 
We want others to be first before us. We want to take the very last place. We want to do for somebody else. Have you opened the door for somebody this morning? I was impressed, and I'm going to call his name, and I'm not trying to embarrass him. But little Joshua Mashburn was standing at the door this past Wednesday night, opening the door for people as they were coming into this building. He didn't know it, but he was showing honor to a lot of us as we entered this building. Whenever his dad drives the handicap bus, he doesn't know it. But every time he operates that lift and lets James down, he's showing honor to James. You see, that's what we do. We show honor to those around us. Men, have you given a lady your seat lately because all the seats were taken in a room or on a bus? I know when we're in El Salvador, that's one of the things that the men always do. When there are ladies standing, men will get up and give them their seats. And we'll stand for however long we have to stand to get to the point we're getting to, simply because there aren't enough seats on the bus. Have you ever let somebody else go ahead of you at a meal? Oh, that's challenging because we're fixing to eat this afternoon, so who's going to be the first in line and who's going to be the last? Maybe we're all competing for the last place. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. But you see, that's what honor is really all about. You're more worthy than I am. If you're a younger person here this morning or if you're an older person, if you're a younger person, have you deferred lately to an older person? No, you, you first. If you're an older person, have you deferred lately to a younger person? Come here, I want you to go ahead of me. Lately, have you stopped doing whatever you were doing and taken the time just to pay attention to a mentally challenged person because they wanted your attention? Or have you thought, no, I've got to find some way to get away because I'm too busy and I need other, there's other things more important to do. Jesus showed honor to children, didn't he? When the disciples didn't have time for them, Jesus showed they're worthy. The kingdom of heaven is made of such as this. When was the last time you showed sincere appreciation for another person? You ever seen somebody out in the Walmart parking lot have a buggy get away from them? Did you chase it down? Did you try to help them? Maybe it was a mother with several children just driving her crazy and she was just trying to get the groceries unloaded before one of the children darted off into the parking lot somewhere? Did you say, can I help? Can I do something for you? Let me, let me get that for you. I'll take your buggy and put it up. You go ahead. I know you're trying to get the kids in the car. In every way, we need to show appreciation for those around us. In every way, we need to work to develop a culture of honor where we are, whether it's here in this congregation, whether it's in our school system, whether it's at our workplace, in our homes, with our husbands, our wives. Men, when was the last time you honored your wife by doing something for her? Or wives, showing him your appreciation. That was a great job you did today, taking care of the yard, or whatever it may be. Just the words that say, I appreciate you. That's showing honor. But what is it that keeps us from showing honor? It's very simple. It really is. There are some enemies. You see, before we can seek to outdo somebody else in showing honor, what we've got to do is overcome the enemies that prevent us from doing that. And those enemies are three things. Pride, selfishness, and self-interest. You see, it goes against our nature a lot of times to show honor to somebody else because typically we want to show honor to ourselves. We want ourselves to have first place. It's about me we live in a me-centered society and in a me-ordered culture. And yet, to truly say, I want to serve you, or to say to somebody, your interest come before my interest requires that I put something else in the place of that pride, that selfishness, and that self-interest, and that's humility. We humble ourselves. And the greatest example we have of that is what we find in Philippians chapter 2. Paul records it for us. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus there in verse 5. And he tells us that although he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something he had to grasp or hold on to, but he emptied himself. And he tells us how he did so. He became, he took, was found in fashion as a man. He, he became a servant. 
He was obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. And as a result of that, God exalted him. But what did Jesus do before all of that? He humbled himself. Honoring others requires that we first develop in our lives humility if we're going to put others before us, if we're going to honor others. And I don't find any other person outside of Jesus Christ that perhaps demonstrated this better than Paul himself. There are three passages in which Paul over and over again talks about, I'm not worthy of these things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, after he's talking about those who had seen the risen Christ and those who had, had been privileged for all of that, he says, I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He said, I put Christians to death. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, To me, the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. I'm the least of the saints. Any other saint is, is of greater value than I am. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost, or King James uses the word chief. This mindset allowed this man to become a servant to all men. I have become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. And folks, that's our goal. Ultimately, it is to save others. What does it matter if they get the honor and we don't? If it is going to save a soul, it's worth it. What does it matter if somebody gets ahead of us in line? It doesn't, because... We want to encourage them and let them know that their soul is valuable. They are important in the scheme that God has set before us this morning and in our lives. I believe that every one of us will be blessed if we sincerely honor others, if we put them first, if we reach out and we demonstrate that. I also know that God will not forget what you have done and neither will those that you have honored because they will remember you for what you've done. Today, I'm asking you to determine in your own mind that we as a congregation, that you as an individual are going to work to develop a culture of honor in this congregation and in this community. Open the door for somebody today out there. Going into a restaurant, hold the door for them. If they've got their hands full, carry a tray for them. Do something for them to say you are valuable. If there's a young waitress that waits upon your table, express your appreciation for her and what she's done for you. But let this be a place where each one of us regards others as more important than ourselves. Let this be a place where each one of us is busy looking out for the interest of others. Let's outdo one another in showing honor. Let's just be a place where we give our lives in humble obedience to our God in serving Him. You know, the, the greatest honor that you can demonstrate today, especially if you're not a Christian, is to make the decision that today I want to give my life to Him who has done all for me. Today, I want to honor God by confessing the name of His Son in obedient faith. Today, I want to turn away from all of the sin in my life. I want to repent and begin following Him because He is worthy of any honor I may demonstrate toward Him. Today, I want to become His child by being buried with Him in baptism. What honor can you pray, pay to God greater than that? Today, if you need to respond to His invitation, won't you come? As together we stand and sing.